Good afternoon. I call to order the Assembly Health Committee meeting of Tuesday, June 23rd. A couple quick announcements. We'll hear two witnesses preside on items with a time limit of three minutes each. Additional witness, witnesses will please state only their name and organization for the record and their position on the respective measure. We have two items that were removed from the calendar. The following bills have been removed from today's agenda at the request of the author, item number nine, bill SB 746, Wolk on food safety grist mills, and item number 12, SB 128, Wolk and Monning on end of life. On our consent calendar, the following bills are proposed for consent. Item number three, SB 123, Senator Liu. Item number five, SB 276, Senator Wolk. Item number 10, SCR 59, Senator Galdiani. And item number 11, SJR 7, Senator Pan. We have our first item on the calendar is item number one, SB 115, Senator Fuller on Valley Fever. And we're going to start as a subcommittee as we don't yet have a quorum. Senator Fuller, whenever you're ready. Thank you for the opportunity to present Senate Bill 115 relating to the Valley Fever vaccine research. California has had a significant increase in Valley Fever cases over the past decade. Cases of Valley Fever have been reported from many counties in California. The highest annual incident rates were in Kern, Kings, Fresno, San Luis Obispo, Tulare, Madera County, and also it's beginning to appear in other states such as Arizona. Valley fever is caused by air or soil disturbance of fungi, which live and breed within the soil. When the dust containing these spores is breathed in, the fungus can attack the respiratory system, causing infection that can lead to symptoms resembling a cold, influenza, or pneumonia. In most severe cases, the fungus can spread to the brain. Because there are currently no cure, the fungus will always remain in the patient's body. Valley fever is costly and debilitating. SB 115 is needed to complete research in progress on valley fever. Vaccine and vaccines provide protection for at-risk at citizens in these areas. Here today with me, I have Ingrid Brostrom from the Center on Race, Poverty, and Environment. Ingrid will speak on the more significant effects of valley fever. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, uh, committee members. Uh, again, my name is Ingrid Brostrom. I'm an attorney with the Center on Race, Poverty, and the Environment. And I have somewhat more personal experience with valley fever when one of my colleagues' young daughter came down with the disease. And we have fought for years to protect valley residents uh, against sources of pollution um, and cumulative impacts. But we had not yet dealt with the the chronic disease um, of valley fever that was so debilitating. Um, and we watched before our eyes as this once vibrant girl uh, became a shell of her former self. And after, after that, uh, many of my colleagues were afraid to travel to the valley because valley fever strikes non-white um, populations uh, with much greater debilitating effect uh, to, to white populations. And it also strikes visitors in the region which have not built up any immunity to the spores. Uh, so, so many of my colleagues would refuse to bring their children down to the valley. Now, valley fever is a very regional disease, and we have experienced that um, diseases such as valley fever that are so regional in, in, in uh, scope do not receive the kind of attention and resources uh, that other, other ailments um, uh, obtain. For example, the National Institute of health provided 50 times more funding to West Nile virus, even though valley fever strikes four times as many people. Uh, so we think it's very important that the state invests in the valley, ensures that the valley receives the same types of protections as other parts of the state, and really continues uh, the research already conducted to, to make sure that there is an answer for children, uh, such as Emily Gorospi, who, who suffered so greatly from this disease. And for those reasons, we respectfully ask that you vote aye today. Thank you. Noticing a quorum, Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Bata? Here. Mainshine? Here. Bonilla? Burke, Chavez, 
Chu? Here. Gomez? Gonzalez? Hernandez? Lackey? Here. Nazarian? Patterson? Here. Ridley Thomas? Here. Rodriguez? Here. Santiago? Steinnorth? Here. Thurmond? Here. Waldron? Here. Wood? Here. We have a quorum. Additional witnesses in support? Laura Fitzgerald, on behalf of the California Life Sciences Association, formerly known as CHI, we support this bill. Thank you. Seeing no witnesses in, are, are there witnesses in opposition? Seeing no witnesses in opposition, any questions or comments from members? Second. We have a motion, we have a second. Senator Fleur, would you like to close? I'd like to ask for an I vote for everyone who comes to visit our area, especially residents of color. Thank you. Thank you. We have a motion. We have a second. The motion is due pass to appropriations. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Bonta? Aye. Bonta, aye. Mainshine? Aye. Mainshine, aye. Bonilla? Burke? Aye. Burke, aye. Chavez? Chu? Chu, aye. Gomez? Gonzalez? Hernandez? Lackey? Aye. Lackey, aye. Nazarian? Patterson? Aye. Patterson, aye. Ridley Thomas? Rodriguez? Aye. Rodriguez, aye. Santiago? Steinorth? Aye. Steinorth, aye. Thurmond? Aye. Thurmond, aye. Waldron? Aye. Waldron, aye. Wood? Aye. Wood, aye. Thank you. The bill passes with a vote of 11 0. Thank you all. Thank you. Next, we have Senator Liu with two bills, SB 492 and SB 118. Good morning, Ms. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Uh, let's start with 118, okay? Please. Uh, 118 regards uh, school-based health and educational partnership programs. School-based health centers are locally designed to meet specific needs of the student population. Centers serve students directly or through referral to an appropriate community provider. The public school health center support program has existed in state statute for nine years but has never been funded. Our clients have relied on federal funds and community support to provide a range of services such as routine physical health, oral health, and mental health issues. With reductions in for funding and other critical safety net programs in recent years, school-based health centers are more important than ever. And SB 118 does four things. It updates and expands the existing school-based health center grant program to include the broader approach of community schools. It modifies sustainability grants to reflect the goals of leveraging existing funding streams. It adds a population health grant for the purpose of targeting specific health and education programs, such as those related to ob obesity, asthma, substance abuse, and mental health. And it updates terminology, including references to the Affordable Care Act and local control funding formula. School-based health centers can be effectively anchored for a broader community school strategy. The community school strategy is a nationally recognized approach for organizing the resources of the community around student success. It is both a place and a set of partnerships among the school and other community resources. Its integrated focus on academics, health, and social services, youth, and community engagement leads to improved student learning, stronger families, and healthier co communities. And I ask for your support on the bill. And I have witnesses uh, that will testify. Good afternoon, Chair and members. My name is Lisa Eisenberg. I'm uh, the Senior Policy Analyst of the California School-Based Health Alliance. Um, we're an organization that represents and advocates for the 231 school-based health centers currently in California, um, as well as the 34 emerging school-based health centers throughout the state, and many more schools, uh, school districts, and community partners interested in this model of health care. As Senator Liu mentioned, SB 118 updates the school-based health center grant program currently in statute to reflect the changing health care and education landscape. We hear from existing and emerging school-based health centers all the time about how critical it is to have state support for these programs. 
I believe many of you are familiar with school-based health centers and know that children come to school every day suffering from serious health con conditions that impact their ability to succeed. Numerous studies have shown that when students have access to a health center on their campus, they are more likely to receive consistent medical and behavioral health care, dental care, and are less likely to go to the emergency room or be hospitalized. I think we also know that school-based health centers do a lot more than provide access to health care. Um, many are implementing unique health education programs that address obesity and asthma. Some are screening entire schools for unaddressed health needs like mental health and oral health. Uh, many school-based health centers go far beyond providing case, by providing case management and wraparound services for the students most in need of care. And many bring, together, bring youth together and provide them with advocacy and leadership opportunities. Young people tell us all the time how their school-based health center provided them with a safe space at their school. These and other aspects of school-based health centers largely go unfunded. And the changes proposed by SB 118 really zero in on the unique services provided by school-based health centers and how the state could support this model of care. Uh, we, as an organization, and our network of school-based health centers continue to advocate through the budget process to fund this grant program. Um, we recognize that by passing SB 118, this is a first step um, to make sure that this grant program is up to date and better meets the current needs of school-based health centers. Thank you so much for your time and attention. I ask for your I vote in support of SB 118. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the Assembly Health Committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of SB 118. Uh, my name is Barbara Cronick, and I'm the Director of Student Support and Health Services with Sacramento City Unified School District. I oversee all of health services as well as 22 student support centers, formerly known as Healthy Start Sites. One of my responsibilities has been to oversee the development and implementation of the Hiram Johnson School-Based Health Center, Sac City's first school-based health center and also the first in Sacramento County. We recently had the ribbon cutting event for the health center and we are now in the process of doing outreach to our student population and the community. Our medical provider is WellSpace Health. I know how much a school-based health center can make a difference in a school. Hiram Johnson is an urban high school with 1,600 students, of which 86% qualify for free and reduced meals. Probably the most significant need is access to health care. Many of our students have unmet health needs. They come to school sick, with injuries that haven't been addressed, major dental problems, and many needing and wanting confidential services. We also have a significant number of students who simply don't come to school due to illnesses. This is a population that needs access to health care. What I've learned during this time is that, like any successful program, it needs good planning. Having funding to assist in the planning process is critical. Taking time to plan, properly assess the needs, identify the barriers, engage all partners, whether students, parents, school staff, administration, and community, and to create the right system are all critical to developing a program that meets the needs and has potential for success and sustainability. School health centers need facilities and startup grants. We were fortunate to receive a HRSA grant that allowed us to renovate and create a state-of-the-art school-based health center. Without that funding, we would not have adequate facilities to truly meet the needs of our students. I believe that with this level of support from the state, more of our students who are currently underserved will have greater opportunities to healthy lives throughout better access to health care. Having a health center on campuses allows, um, will provide the necessary care for our students and will ultimately impact our outcome of ensuring all our students have optimal physical, mental, and social health so that they can be successful in school and in life. Again, I want to thank you for your support of SB 118. 
Thank you. Additional witnesses in support, just please state your name, organization, and position. They're here for another oh. bill. Okay. <laughs> Go to the microphone. Kim Kimberly Chen on behalf of the California Pan Ethnic Health Network and the Alliance of Boys and Men of Color Health Work Group in support. Enrique Roacho with the California Association of School Business Officials in support. Jasmine Gordon with the California Black Health Network in support. Anna Hasselblad with the Steinberg Institute in support. Danielle Kando Kaiser on behalf of Common Sense Media, Common Sense Kids Action in support. Latoya Ramsey, National Association of Social Workers, California Chapter in support. Kathy Hall, California State PTA in support. Khadija Alam Javed with the Advancement Project in support. Thank you. Any witnesses in opposition? Seeing none, we have a motion. We have a second. Any questions or comments from committee members? Assemblymember Thurman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Lou, for uh, bringing this bill. Uh, you know, I've had a chance to work with School Based Health Center um, as a school board member and also as a social worker in, uh, in two counties, and I've been very impressed with uh, the ability of those who work in the centers to really support the social and health development needs of students in a very broad range um, that you and your witnesses have described. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm deeply impressed by that. I simply wanted to ask you, is there any data to support that, um, that there's also an academic benefit to the students? And, and I, I know that you've worked on full service community schools and mm -hmm. we all sort of know instinctually that when kids have their needs met, if they're in pain or they're hungry or they need something, that that's gonna help them be better learners. But everyone that we've talked to has struggled to provide us the data, and it just seems to me that we could generate more funding for school-based health centers if we could show that this is the right thing to do, but there's an actual academic benefit, benefit. to it. Can you point us in the direction of that data? Well, you know, I have not um, seen that data. I think I think community schools, the folks who pro are proponents of that, I think they're working on the data because I agree with you. Our kids who come to school that are uh, healthy, have had something to eat, uh, are better equipped to address the, uh, their academic needs. So it just makes sense, but uh, we don't have uh, that kind of data, academic data. And, and clearly this is the right thing to do, and I hope everyone on this committee in this House supports it. I just thought if there's a way for us to get to that too, we'd be able to generate even bigger grants for the, the centers as they're ready to open. That's right. We'll work with you on it and see if we can't find that elusive data. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments or questions from committee members? See none. Senator Liu, would you like to close? I would simply ask you for your I vote. Thank you. We have a motion. We have a second. The motion is due passed to education. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Bonta? Aye. Bonta, aye. Mainshine? Aye. Mainshine, aye. Bonilla? Burke? Aye. Burke, aye. Chavez? Chu? Aye. Chu, aye. Gomez? Gonzalez? Hernandez? Lackey? Lackey, aye. Nazarian? Patterson? Aye. Patterson, aye. Ridley Thomas? Rodriguez? Aye. Rodriguez, aye. Santiago? Stein North? Aye. Stein North, aye. Thurmond? Aye. Thurmond, aye. Waldron? Wood? Aye. Wood, aye. The bill passes with a vote of 10 0. Thank you very much. Thank you. Senator Liu, please present SB 492 whenever you're ready. Thank you. Um, 492 requires DHCS to create an educational guide for consumers in the Coordinated Care Initiative, or the CCI. This guide would inform beneficiaries of their rights and provide information on how to access service. I'm pleased to accept the amendments proposed by the committee on page 4. Uh, of the analysis, which requires DC, DHCS to update the guide annually as the CCI continues to evolve. I thank the committee for their efforts in improving the bill. Individuals in the CCI are some of California's most vulnerable populations, low-income seniors and persons with disabilities. Currently, CCI rollout in some pilot counties has not gone smoothly. Their enrollment process is complex and confusing. Consumers don't know their rights, their options, or how to access resources. Lacking this information, they and their families cannot make informed decisions about their care. D 
DHCS currently publishes a guide specifically detailing consumer rights, but only for a small portion of the CCI population, those enrolled in CalMediConnect. For the remaining 66% of the CCI population receiving managed long-term services and supports, consumers rely on the various health providers in each of the pilot counties for information on their rights and resources. This bill streamlines information across various sources into one document provided at the agency level. Requiring DHCS to develop this guide also signals the state's commitment to greater accountability, transparency, and most importantly, consistency in the delivery of information on CCI services and support. And I respectfully ask your I vote. And today I have a couple of folks um, are testifying in uh, support of the bill. I am Jack Neely with Government Action and Communications Institute, a nonprofit organization that provides staff work to a statewide collaborative of aging and disability organizations. SB 492 directs the Department of Healthcare Services to provide consumers with a guide that spells out their rights in the Coordinative Care Initiative, or CCI. The CCI is a complicated effort with various pieces. The rights of CCI consumers come from multiple sources federal law and regulation, state law and regulation, from a memorandum of understanding between CMS and DHCS, from th three-way contracts among CMS, DHCS, and each participating health plan, and from the various all-plan letters and duals-plan letters that the DHCS releases. Currently, DHCS makes available a 24-page booklet that, in a corner of page 17, lists a few of the rights of those in CalMediConnect. The list is incomplete and it doesn't apply to recipients of managed long-term services and supports, which is how 80% of consumers participate in the CCI. The CCI has the potential to expand statewide where it will dictate the way more than 1 million low-income aged and disabled Californians receive health and social services. It is appropriate for the legislature to provide statutory direction to DHCS to provide these consumers with basic information about their rights in this new and far-reaching program. In SB 492, the legislature provides that direction. GACI, ask for your I vote. Additional witnesses in support? Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Beverly Yu, and I'm with UDW, AFSCME Local 3930, representing 77,000 IHS providers in 21 counties throughout California. We are here today in strong support of SB 492. We are committed to the success of the Coordinated Care Initiative, and we believe that the people with disabilities and seniors should be well informed of their rights and know how to navigate the system if issues arise. For these reasons, we respectfully ask for your I vote. Thank you. Additional witnesses in support. Good afternoon, Aaron Lewis for the Consumer Federation of California in support. Thank you. Good afternoon, Linda Way with Western Center on Law and Poverty in support. Latoya Ramsey, National Association of Social Workers, California chapter in support. Thank you. Any witnesses in opposition? Good afternoon. I'm Jennifer Gabals with the California Association of Health Plans. Um, our member plans in the CCI counties are very invested in the CCI and are uh, working very hard for the success of that program. However, we are opposed to the bill uh, due to the fact, which the supporters already men mentioned, that the department does issue the CalMediConnect guidebook. Um, it includes all of the beneficiary rights in it, uh, including the information for uh, calling to re, re, uh, re <clears throat> to make phone to s provides the phone numbers to access the department and plans if there are issues with their eligibility or they have questions about uh, denials for care. The only thing that's missing in the CalMediConnect guidebook is a list of the providers, and the guidebook uh, refers the readers to their plan websites for the complete list of the providers that provide 
services and care under the, within this program. So it's not that we don't want enrollees to have access to that information, but we're very concerned about the additional use of limited state resources to develop a guidebook when one currently exists. Thank you. Thank you. Additional witnesses in opposition? Seeing none, any questions or comments from committee members? We have a motion, we have a second. Senator Liu, would you like to close? Simply ask for your aye vote. Thank you. We have a motion, we have a second. The motion is due pass as amended to appropriations. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Bonta? Aye. Bonta, aye. Mainshine? Mainshine, aye. Bonilla? Burke? Aye. Burke, aye. Chavez? Two? Two, aye. Gomez? Gonzalez? Hernandez? Lackey? Aye. Lackey, aye. Nazarian? Patterson? No. Patterson, no. Ridley Thomas? Rodriguez? Aye. Rodriguez, aye. Santiago? Steinorth? Aye. Steinorth, aye. Thurmond? Aye. Thurmond, aye. Waldron? Aye. Waldron, aye. Wood? Aye. Wood, aye. The bill passes with a vote of 10 to 1. Congratulations. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman, members.